such Sarasota and I especially want to welcome our visitors both in person. I met a few of you uh, earlier this morning as well as our visitors who may be uh, with us streaming online on YouTube. I want to invite our visitors to participate in any of the events at the congregation and we welcome you to find out more about uh, this congregation as well as Unitarian Universalism. If you want, I encourage you to register on our website uh, where you can, uh, there's a virtual guest book uh, via the link on our homepage at uusrp.org. If you're here in person, we have a welcome table right outside the sanctuary uh, where you can sign up as well. And if you do, if you do, you will get one weekly email uh, that tells you about all the events that are happening at the congregation, and as well, you'll get some Zoom links for online events that are happening. As always, after service, we have uh, coffee and snacks uh, at the, uh, in the courtyard right outside, and we do look forward to getting to know each other. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions, don't ever hesitate to ask. Whether you're a visitor or a member, we encourage questions. So I do want to thank uh, Mary Ann Lilly from uh, the chair of our Greek team, uh, as well as Nina Turkelli, uh, the convener of the Racial Justice Coordinating Team for joining and planning and participating in today's service, uh, celebrating Earth Day, as well as Sharon Howie, who will be participating as chair of our social justice team. A couple of short announcements. The Art Council is proud to feature a new art exhibit. What was so funny? <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, what, what was so funny about the Art Council? <laughs> but you know, it shows art comes in many forms, okay? You know what we do here on Sunday morning is a work of art, I like to think. But anyway, we're actually having an exhibit in the lecture wing after the service is one way that we connect with each other as members and make meaning. Um, and so please, after service, uh, you can go there and it'll be up for a few weeks as well. This Thursday night, uh, April 25th at 6.30 in person, and then next Sunday, 3 o'clock on Zoom, our own Reverend Brock Leach will be leading a workshop on how we can build a multicultural, multi-generational beloved community. Uh, he will share information and lead a brainstorming session. And last but not least, uh, next Sunday after service, please join us for a congregational conversation about the proposed UUA, this is next Sunday, uh, about the proposed UUA Article 2 bylaw change. If you don't know what that is, even more reason to come. Um, and so put that on your calendar, if you will. Um, and so now, Please join me in welcoming our special, our special musical guest, Joe Yadlo and Paul Kaufman. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Back in the, I don't know, it could have been the 60s or maybe it was the 70s, Joni Mitchell wrote a song about the state of our planet. And today is Earth Day. So, um, I'm going to sing that special song that Joni Mitchell wrote back then, and it's still just as relevant today. We've made some strides, you know, but we still need to do some more. It says it's about a taxi, but it's not. They paradise and they pull up a parking lot With a pink hotel, a boutique and a swing hot spot I had to do this Sorry, I had the guitar muted <laughs> Thought it always seemed to go But you don't know what you got Oh, what you don't know what you 
My drummer for my Joni Mitchell band. So maybe you can uh, come see our Joni Mitchell tribute sometime.
us again. We got to do some amazing artists this morning. So I'd never learned this song, never heard this song before, but it's by James Taylor. And it's about our Mother Earth, Gaia. And Gaia is the, the Greek, I believe it was the Greek goddess of the Earth. So that's what he uses. And he ends, his, he ends the song on a kind of a hopeless, hopeless phrase. He says, no one's going to stop us now. But I would invite you to sing with me just the word Gaia at the end. I was blood light in the land of dark. The sun rose up over Central Park. I was walking home from work. Yeah, yeah. The petal sky and the rosy dawn. The world turning on the burning sun. Sacred wet green one that we live on, Gaia. Run, 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 said the automobile, and we ran. Run for your life, take to your heels. Pray 
for yourselves and for God's sake to nine leaders by Naimante Nankimo. Dear presidents of the nine Amazonian countries and to all the world leaders that share responsibility of plundering the planet. We indigenous people are fighting to save the Amazon, but the whole planet is in trouble because you do not respect it. My name is Namante Nankimo. I'm a Warani woman, a mother, a leader of my people. And the rainforest is my home. I'm writing this letter because the fires are raging still, because the miners are stealing gold as they have for 500 years, and leaving behind open pits and toxins. Because the land grabbers are cutting down primary forest so the cattle can graze, plantations can be grown, and the white man can eat. It took us thousands of years to get to know the Amazon rainforest to understand her ways, her secrets, to learn how to survive and thrive with her. And for my people, the Warani, we have only known you for 70 years. We were contacted in the 1950s by American evangelical missionaries. But we are fast learners and you are not as complex as the rainforest. When you say that you are urgently looking for climate solutions, yet continue to build a world community, economy that's based on extraction and pollution, we know you are lying because we are the closest to the land and to first and the first to hear her cries. This forest has taught us how to walk lightly. And because we have listened, learned, and defended her, she has given us everything. Water, clean air, nourishment, shelter, medicines, happiness, meaning. And you're taking all of this away not from us, but from everyone on the planet and from future generations. The earth does not expect you to save her. She expects you to respect her. And we, as indigenous peoples, 
expect the same. As we enter into our time of silence, let us contemplate how we can walk lightly on this earth and how we can respect the earth and indigenous cultures. Greetings to all of you here today and to those of you who are watching uh, and Zooming online. I am Nina Tortelli and I convene our racial justice coordinating team here at the Unitarian Universalists of Sarasota. I am also a volunteer at the Multicultural Health Institute founded by Dr. Lisa Merritt approximately 20 years ago in the Newtown community here in Sarasota. Pictured here is Dr. Merritt with a colleague in her office on Martin Luther King Jr. Way. Today, I would like to share with you some examples and reflections where environmental justice and racial justice are interconnected locally. One might assume that in the United States, everyone has equal access to health services and healthy environments. However, we know this is not true, even as much as we wish it were. I personally have become more and more aware of and saddened by the structural and, and systemic racial inequities that are present right here in Sarasota. The more we learn about our racial history, we learn about decades and decades of environmental injustices affecting our most vulnerable communities. April is National Minority Health Month. This National Health Observance raises the awareness of health disparities that affect populations of racial and ethnic minorities. Through research, education, preventative screening, and community connections and collaborations, the Multicultural Health Institute, which from now on I'll refer to as MHI, works on many levels to reduce these disparities. Studies after studies have shown that there is an increased prevalence of diabetes, 
high blood pressure, end-stage renal disease, infant mortality rates, respiratory problems, and many more in the underserved communities with high populations of racial minorities, like the Newtown community right here in Sarasota. MHI has a long history of environmental health research, education, and advocacy. And you can find some of these statistics on their website. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the examples is the 2018 survey assessment summarizing the zip code 34234, the area with the highest African American population and also has the highest asthma um, rates in Sarasota. At the time of this study, 58% of survey respondents noticed dust every time or almost every time when they passed Booker High School, which is on Myrtle Street. 28% of respondents reported respiratory problems, and these individuals made up the highest percentage of emergency room visits due to asthma. If you are familiar with this location, you know that Booker High School is on the south side of Myrtle Street. And directly across the street is the Anderson Asphalt or Concrete Company, or it may go by another name by now. I took these pictures on Friday in preparation for my time with you today. When the weather is dry, particulate matter gets tracked into the roads and into the, into the air by vehicles. When it rains, I understand that the dust flows into our storm drains and enters our waterways. The entire north side of Myrtle Street is industrial. If you drive by, you see metal scrap collections, other companies, the entire street. Directly opposite are private homes and Booker High School. In a newspaper article I read a while back addressed this problem. And there's another industrial concrete site further south um, on, on Central Avenue that is also problematic. This area was once known as Overton. Newspaper articles and advocacy can lead to legal action. In fact, in 2022, there was a settlement by and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, attorney Justin Bloom and Sarasota Waterkeepers addressing the violation of the Environmental Protection Act surrounding local water pollution. Following this settlement, MHI, along with other, many other community groups like the Amaryllis Park Neighborhood Association and the Community Health Action Team, known as CHAT, conducted a community-led assessment survey and are forming next steps on how the community might use these funds. By the way, CHAT meets regularly at the Betty J. Johnson Library in Newtown and um, it's also on Zoom, and it's open to anyone who's interested in local community health. Another local study called DASH, which is Data Across Sectors of Health, helped the community identify social determinants of health, those important non-medical factors that influence a person's health and well-being such as where one lives, or what, well, first, where one was born, where one lives, learns, plays, worships, and ages. We know personally that the health of our environment is deeply interconnected with our health and our quality of life. Like green spaces, trees, community gardens, to name a few, and of course, along with access to health services, healthy food, transportation, employment, and housing, so much of these factors are lacking in our underserved communities. Don't we wish it would be better for all? 
Increasing the public's awareness of these inequities are so important for change. Equally important is promoting health information to all through community events and health fairs. Some of our members have helped with these events. MHI co-sponsored the Black Family Wellness Expo that was held this past March and was attended by many who were seeking information to pass on to others. A variety of community organizations were there to share information and resources with each other and to those who attended. MHI community health care workers, also called health care navigators, assist vulnerable individuals in assessing their essential health care needs and provide resources and recommendations that are, um, and these recommendations resulted in many referrals. Navigators, as you see in this picture, are representative of the neighborhood and sensitive to the community members they serve. I think this is a crucial aspect of the MHI model and other black founded and, black and led nonprofits that this congregation supports. Personal relationships and community connections build trust and help develop resilience in individuals while addressing their many identified social determinants of health that they experience. I personally like the MHI slogan, better health care through better understanding. One year ago, in April of 2023, MHI hosted an, the Environmental Justice Workshop, gathering many key environmental community leaders, organizations, and stakeholders to address the multiple aspects of the intersectionality of the environment and healthy living. Mary Ann, myself, and others in this congregation attended that workshop. The collaborative efforts from the many attendees produced a rich and fruitful summary, listing nine com concepts of an ideal, healthy environment, along with a detailed list of challenges and solutions for each. Look for the link to that report in next week's contact, and you can see the whole summary, which is fascinating, and there's lots of action plans that are hopeful, and we know they will take lots of time and take collaborative efforts. There are many who are willing and up for the challenge. There are things you can do individually to help level the health care playing field for all, to reduce health disparities, and create environmental justice to heal our world. There are too many action plans to list in this short message of mine today, but there is one action that you can take right now, and that is to make your donation <laughs> to our ongoing good work of this congregation. So please be generous as you give for those who are online, um, or you can scan the QR code and let this sacred time begin. Thank you.
Good morning. I would like you to uh, look, make sure that you check out the insert in today's program. You have the full text of Theo Wilson's poem, and I'm just going to be reading an excerpt of it. And you also have a pledge for the environment that you can put on the refrigerator. We carefully printed it so you can put it right up on your refrigerator. So we do, we do hope you'll join us. So without further ado, here's Theo Wilson's poem. Welcome to Earth. Like you, the species has some growing up to do. But believe me, we are trying. Trying not to be the impending disaster of giving primates rocket launches and letting them loose to target practice in Eden. Of turning the tables on our predators and putting their extinction on our menu. Our future lies somewhere in the gray, in the tension between our nukes and namaste. Who would have guessed that we could wrap the world around our opposable thumbs with the power to make a meal or a metaphor from the heart of a lion? Shape shifting ape becoming locust and honeybee in the garden of Gaia. It is now time to choose our final form. The whales are waiting to sing our praises or sound the alarm of the ones who taught both oak and steel to swim, who strung his bow with the hide of the biblical serpent, became a god, and named the smallest particle Adam. Our eyes are reflective services for a reason. Look hard enough, and there we are, a shared suffering gleaming. As a species, we are learning that prejudice is pricey. Are these hierarchies or just trash heaps of human potential? Maybe ra racism ain't just evil. It is outdated social tech. We upgrade by facing history's eyes open because a culture only needs a cast when their society is broken. Well, I dream of a world terraformed into a spinning space garden, a thriving greenhouse from a repurposed penitentiary, resurrecting honeybees and hope when they almost went extinct because we tiptoed to oblivion and pulled it back from the brink. And generations from now, when our grandkids go galactic and the ETs ask them who we are, tell them I'm the being from the African savanna. I stared down the saber tooth and de-extinct the mammoth. I played the symphony in my gen genome like a ballad to the stars. I stole my dust from two-legged singularity. All heavenly bodies add up to just one. Just say victory. Say invincible spirit from here to planet Z. I am the generation that finally got it right because I am humanity. Thank you.
than what they used to be. Where did all our blue skies go? Poison is the wind that blows from north and south and east and whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, mercy, mercy me. Oh, things ain't what they used to be. Oil is wasted on our oceans and upon our seas. Fish full of mercury. Whoa. Sky. Animals and birds that live nearby are dying. Oh, 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 mercy, mercy me. Oh, 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 things ain't what they used to be. What about this overcrowded land? How much more use for man can she stand? Whoa, whoa, whoa. on bread. That was the choice that was made by all involved, right? For, uh, for so, and no one was harmed in that case, actually. Maybe the sacrificers batting average, but in the scheme of things, that's not a big deal. Um, but in this case, um, sacrifice zones are areas that we have, without approval of those who are impacted, intentionally and knowingly harmed um, communities with pollution. In almost all cases, the areas that were harmed were inhabited by poor people who more often than not would identify as BIPOC, black indigenous people of color. 
The most common publicized one was Flint, Michigan, a predominantly black community that had their water supply changed to a source that had high levels of lead that led to disastrous, disastrous health results. But the reason was to save taxpayer money. So a clear choice to sacrifice lives and futures in a community so others did not have to sacrifice some money. Since then, there are few, uh, further investigations that have shown uh, the same challenges that uh, have impacted predominantly uh, BIPOC communities across the country. I won't go through the whole list. Less well known, at least to me, um, is an, uh, an 85 mile stretch of Louisiana along the Mississippi River between Baton Rouge and New Orleans that is called Cancer Alley because it contains over 100 petrochemical plants and refineries that continuously expose a predominantly black and low-income communities to toxic air pollution linked, and it's specifically linked to higher cancer rates. Not forgetting as well the historical injustices to the indigenous people um, in this country as an example, even currently, uh, through the Dakota Access Pipeline, indigenous people are subject to potential oil spills that could damage their water supplies and ancient burial grounds. So the question of who sacrifices is the question. Because of the long history of racial uh, segregation and thus inability of people of color to get housing uh, in certain areas and as well as the lack of political power. BIPOC people are often the ones who have to make the sacrifice without even their knowledge or consent. We see it where, where these chemical plants are built. Um, you know, not in my backyard is often the common phrase that people don't don't want it, and so they go to places where people do not have political power. And admittedly, right, I, I sacrifice very little myself. I only knowingly sacrifice little things. I right? purchase, and, and there, it's not that it is unimportant, like the opening reading said, but in the scheme of things, right, I, I purchase reusable shopping bags. I try to use or limit my use of single-use plastics. I, I bought a Prius. Um, which I love, by the way, and I, I highly recommend if you can afford them. Uh, but, but again, that's another thing, right? Uh, income disparity um, as well forces those who, who are poorer to not have the ability um, to even take measures to move out of their neighborhoods uh, where there may be dangers or where they're forced to move. Like even in our neighborhood, there's a story. Originally, you know, the, this is like when Booker schools were built in the early 1900s, it was moved farther north because they wanted to force the African American community to move out of the neighborhood that they were in so that they could develop it. And, and so they moved to school, and people didn't have cars back then, and so in order for their children to go to school, they had to move up to that area. So it, it is a very systemic plan uh, thing. Um, you know, well, another thing I do is I, I buy Kindle books. Partially, that's because I don't have any more room on my bookshelves, but it is environmentally friendly. Uh, one of the books that I bought with that was Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything. And truth, and one more thing, if I if I seen the actual book, I might not have bought it because it was like 600 pages, you know. But on Kindle, it doesn't look that big. I'll just say that. Um, but anyway, um, I, I had to put it down about halfway through, not just because it was 600 pages, but because it was a little depressing, honestly. Not just a discussion about the devastation of climate change that had already been uh, rendered, not just the devastation that's still to come if we don't act, not just the uncovering of in many environmental nonprofit agencies that were taking money from the fossil fuel industry, not just the wanton deceptive practices that the extraction industry has used um, to uh, confuse people and delay meaningful action, 
but also the lack of will and an unwillingness for our entire society to sacrifice, to create meaningful change. And in order to have far-reaching change, it will require a seismic shift in our values as a country and as a world. And this is not a new idea. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1967 said, we as a nation must undergo radical revolution of our values. We must rapidly begin to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. We, uh, end quote. We as a religious people have a moral obligation to work towards changing those values. And although climate change is an issue of survival, it also is a moral issue. How do we treat our fellow human beings, all our fellow human beings? What will we provide for our descendants? How do we see ourselves as part of the oneness of all that is? Or do we see ourselves just separate and apart fighting for resources? Can we come to understand that we are all in this together? So I picked up the book again and kept reading, knowing that within it, I would find a window that was a way in no way. So there is a reminder in the book that there have been victories, and we should remember the victories that we had. New York State banning fracking, stopping the Keystone XL pipeline, the blocking of coal export terminals in the Pacific Northwest, the disinvestment of fossil fuels, investment in alternative fuel sources. That is accelerating. It is people, people like you, people like I, who are going out there and working to make change. And I'm here to remind you, we have the power to do this. We've seen local communities throughout the country partnering, actually, with indigenous communities, recognizing the wisdom of their ancient um, cultures. Klein goes on to say, and I quote, we owe to one another based on our shared humanity and what it is that we collectively value more than economic growth and corporate profits. Indeed, a great deal of work of deep social change involves having debates during which new stories can be told to replace the old stories that have failed us." End quote. And that is one reason why we come together in religious community to tell new stories, to provide hope, new hope for the future and for our descendants, stories that remind us that we are more powerful together and that we are here to support each other, stories to educate ourselves and model a better way of living in the world. We must pay attention to the earth. We can learn how to live our life from our direct experiences with the earth. The first source of wisdom in our living tradition uh, of Unitarian Universalism is a direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder which moves us to a renewal of the spirit to the forces which create and uphold life. So we need to listen to the pain of the earth because we are causing it pain. We need to understand our interdependence with the earth. We must recognize that how we exist in the trajectory that we are on is not sustainable. We must connect with the earth. Our society has become more and more disconnected from the earth. It's why we like to put our feet in the ocean or our hands in the dirt, even in our small gardens at home, or as we gaze, as we go like to the Grand Canyon. Because as environmentalist Rachel Carson said, and I quote, I believe that the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for destruction, end quote. So Earth, teach us. Teach us to live within our means, if we do, we will, there will be enough for more of us. Earth, teach us to provide for others as you have provided so much for us. Earth, teach us when it is time to lie fallow, to rest so that we may 
be healthy in mind, body, and spirit to help sustain others. And just as we know that the land must lay fallow at times to allow for new growth, earth teaches patience, just as it takes a lifetime for an oak tree to grow, let us learn that our actions may not have impact until way into the future. Earth teaches us that, we are, that there are ways to create a new, just as there are new flowers every year that appear before us each year in all of its wonder and its splendor. Naomi Klein, at the end of her book, asked, History knocked at your door. Did you answer it? We are in the middle of creating history for our descendants. Earth, teach us to awake and answer the door before it is too late. May it be so. I invite you to rise in body and or spirit for our closing hymn, Blue Boat Home. our song leaders. And now please join me in extinguishing our chalice. If we can move forward. Uh, yeah, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you all for your presence here today and even the extra five minutes. I do appreciate it. Go out and have fun and be good. <laughs>